Emma Gannon, we have wanted to do this for so long. Thank God. Thank God we're actually doing this. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for this conversation. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. And there's been sort of weird connections with us um, that I've discovered over the years. So we met, I don't know how many years ago it was now, when you interviewed me. And since then, I've found out that you used to work with my cousin, Ben Cotton, (laughs) which is so random. Love Ben. I've got a lot of time for Ben. Ben is so sweet. I never see Ben anymore because he's now moved to Seattle. So yes. he rarely... And had a baby. Had two babies. Amazing. Heidi and Sadie. And he was really a very cute. comforting presence in an office that I worked at where I actually met my husband. So that was a really good time. Good wow. people. Wow. Wow. So how many years ago would this have been? Sort of... Oh, like 10 years ago. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Always six degrees. It's so weird, isn't it? Six yeah. degrees of separation. It's a reminder mad. to be nice to people, maybe. A reminder to be nice, <laughs> exactly, because word gets out. Um, so th- uh, there's just millions of things buzzing around my head that I want to talk to you uh, about today. But I think a subject that I keep coming back to, whether it's within this space or on Instagram or with my writing, is something that you've really dug into in your new book, Disconnected, How to Stay Human in an Online World, which I loved. And I love the fact that this book and your last book, Sabotage, have this gorgeous polka dot front cover and are just so neat. It's a delicious little hardback. Thank you. Pocket sized. It's so pocket sized and dreamy. And um, that word human really jumped out at me on the front. I think it's so important to look into this subject because we obviously have all got into this habit of thinking that we're more connected because we're on our phones the whole time, we're talking to people, we're conversing with well strangers a lot of the time. But we can't ignore the fact that part of this is stripping away our humanness. And it's it's been done so incrementally, we've barely noticed, with like a discomfort hanging out with people in real life, perhaps, or a lack of eye contact or eating dinner and you're kind of checking your phone at the same time and all these things that have crept up on us. And it's sort of terrifying, but you you dissect all of this without it being too scary. I feel like you've got a good balance of going, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Do you feel optimistic about it? There is an optimism running through this book, which people have picked up on, which I really like, because I think there's a lot of books about the doom and gloom. There's a lot of books out there about screen time. Like, we know it all. We actually know all the information Mm -hmm. now. That documentary, The Social Dilemma, was a big one where we realised the Silicon Valley tech gurus weren't letting their kids use the same technology they'd built. And all of that stuff was really scaremongering. But I wanted to write a book that was like, okay, what do we do with that information and what solutions could we bring to ourselves? And also the fact that I did want to talk about being human. We're not like a static profile picture where we're a personal brand and like everything must be on brand. And I've written about that for years. And in some ways, yes, we do have a self on the internet now, like a virtual self that I wear a lot of yellow and I wear glasses and yes, I am a little picture. But we're also a barrel of contradictions. Like human beings are so complex. We change our minds every single day. We get things wrong. We mess up. We make mistakes. We're not the same person every day. Like, I don't know if you ever say, oh, I don't feel like myself today or yeah. I feel like a completely different person today. We're just up and down and ebb and flow. And I think the internet doesn't really allow for that. No, certainly, certainly like the mistake part of that. We're not allowed to have flaws seemingly or trip up and as you know we, like you just said we're human that's inevitable that's all part of us learning and growing but you know we we do get kind of trapped in this weird vortex that we've got to appear perfect we've got to appear always completely empathetic to everyone and everything and understand everyone and everything and know <laughs> everything and it, it's impossible and it's really stressful and i think because it's snuck up so incrementally we we're sort of now maybe assessing it all going oh god how did we get here because you you say in the book um and obviously in your first book control alt delete you know you're born in 1989 so that was the year the world wide web was conceived (laughs) um i'm a bit older than you so i was eight then i don't remember the internet at all at that period i think i started to get a whiff of it maybe in my early teens But it did feel quite innocent then. Like, I remember going to my dad's cousin's house randomly. He was the first person I knew who had the internet. And he was like, 
look at this. And we went on his computer and I remember this so clearly. There was a circle with lots of different musical instruments and if you clicked on the saxophone, it played. Or if you clicked on a drum, it played. And I was like, <laughs> what on earth? Like, I literally couldn't process what I was seeing. And it just seemed expansive, exciting and really innocent. Can you even pinpoint when it started to go wrong? Or do you think there was always... Do you think the big dogs in Silicon Valley always knew that this had the propensity to get ugly? Mm, That's such a good question. And I think it's like when you work in a job and you have your head down for five years and you look up and go, how long have I been here? I feel like we've just been on our phones, like head down, that we haven't noticed time moving. And it's true. It was really good. There was a time where where it was amazing. And there's lots of studies in the book. I think it was 2011 was a really good time for the internet where... People were reconnecting with old friends, like on Friendster and Facebook, and kids were doing better at school because of the internet. And political change was happening in a good way because of Twitter. And we were like, oh, my God, this could be amazing. And I think over the last five years, something's changed where it's making us miserable. And there are, of course, still good things, and you can still make really good friends. And and also, I guess it's important to say that the internet isn't like a thing. It's not like a sentient being. We're the things that are using it. Mm. So we have got worse. We've forgotten that. Like, <laughs> it's not telling us, okay, yes, it's telling us where to go and it's influencing us, but actually we are the collective thing that makes the internet what it is. So something's gone really wrong, I think. And yeah, we, we need to take back control. I think that's why I wanted to write this book is... Yes, we're disconnected from each other, but really we're disconnecting from ourselves. The elephant in the room is like, where's our time going? Yeah. Um, and people are you know, wanting to quit their jobs and change up their life. And people are taking online courses at the moment and, and leaning into spirituality and getting more philosophical. But we're kind of addicted to this thing that pulls us away from who we really are. You know, I know you have spoken about this, but there are some days I wake up in such good mood and I feel really at peace like with who I am and I will see something on the internet and I will spiral into such a dark hole because of one thing I've seen and it it was just like a booby trap of like triggers. So I think we've got to just really look after ourselves as well. And also we've created this weird separation. There's like our lives and then there's this life online that exists and sometimes we believe that that's more important. And I'm not just talking about social media, I'm talking about how we imbibe news, how we find out about certain things going on in the world, how we receive information, etc. We sometimes think that that is more potent, necessary and meaningful than our actual existence. And that's propelled us into this other sort of modern day phenomenon that that we definitely didn't fall into this trap, say, 20 years ago, that we feel we've got to constantly be doing is the obvious one, but also knowing. We've got to know all this stuff and and gather all this information. Whereas 20 years ago, when I was 20, I didn't give a toss about any of that. I was just like, where can I have fun? How can I have fun in my actual life? Yes, exactly. And again, it's been very incremental that we're now placing so much more importance on the doing, always being on, connecting with other people. That was just not a thing 20 years ago. Yeah, and I really miss so much of my old life and self. And I suppose my career is very much online and I wanted to acknowledge that so much good has come from it. And I'm very, you know, I've written about the internet for like nearly 10 years now and I was there like at the very start of like blogger culture and I was working in an agency where we paid the first blogger to do a campaign, all that stuff. So it's like I've seen the the growth of the influencer industry and I, I can come at it from like an analytical point of view. But I also found that I was just so lost and really sad and too in that world and realised that... I wanted my friends back. I wanted myself back. I didn't know what music I liked anymore because of like the Spotify algorithms. I didn't know what books I wanted to read because of Amazon. I didn't know what I wanted to wear because I was like getting all these blogger discount codes and I didn't really know who my friend like there was a moment where I was like who are my actual friends? And like my friends from school were like, "Oh yeah, we lost you for a bit there." You got very confused with like lots of different friendships and, and things that weren't necessarily what, what you thought they were. And I was just in this like really lost part of my life. And then I just reconnected with like the things that matter. And I, and it sounds like really cliche, but, but I think I'm of a generation that did get lost in that world for a bit. That's why I think, you know, the cliche is kind of a reality. It's like loads of people <laughs> feel like this. So, you know, it's talked about a lot because so many people feel like, 
just utter confusion because we're so overwhelmed by everything. And you talk about this sort of great mix up in the book where we've mixed up great friends with what would have been back in the day acquaintances the person you bumped into in the coffee shop and you've only ever said hi and that's it you know I've got loads of people on my local street that every morning I go you're right I don't know their name but I just go or nod to them and we've conflated the two and now we're influenced by our acquaintances rather than the people that we know like inside out and trust and I'd never thought about that until I read your book I was like holy shit I'm being influenced by not only acquaintances, but strangers a lot of the time. I don't know anything about their life, their upbringing, their moral compass, their set of values, yet something they've said or done has made me start thinking differently or just tweaked something. And I guess going back to you sort of saying about how we are losing ourselves more than the sort of connection to other people, we're sort of forgetting how to tap into our gut instinct Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that intuition that we've all got. It's a given that we've all got the propensity to to make decisions based on a feeling. It's sort of hard to even articulate what that is. Have you found ways of tuning back into that and making decisions that come from you and your heart rather than, oh, that, that seems to be trending right now, whatever it might be? Yes, yes, that's exactly it. When I really boil it down, really what the book for me was about is we have tried to get wisdom from everyone else but ourselves. And it's like the wisdom isn't on your phone. The wisdom isn't in a self-help book. It's it's really inside. And I think we're just too distracted and busy and noisy. That And there's a quote in the book that um, is like, man's problem stems from not being able to sit alone in a room quietly or something. Mm. I've completely butchered that. But this idea that if we could just stop for five minutes and and lit and I don't really meditate, but what I do is just sometimes just pause. And I've interviewed I interviewed a lot of people in the book actually about how we've lost that instinct and how I used to go on Twitter just to see what other people were saying before I knew what I wanted to say. And that is normal. Like back in the day, we'd probably look at our neighbours or the village and be like, what do you think? What do you think? Before we make up our mind. But I was I was not even going there at, in any way first to kind of figure out what I thought about things. So when I talk about being influenced with like my clothes and my music, I mean, that's one thing. But being influenced with what you actually think about the world, like that's terrifying. Yeah. And we're also obviously living in like cancel culture world where... It's not just people in the public eye. This is like people, um, the studies say, that are scared to even put their thoughts on their WhatsApp group because they're scared to lose their friends because their friends might disagree with them. And I just thought, God, we've got to this point where we're too scared to air our real thoughts. Like, there's something really scary about that. It's so (laughs) scary. I hate it because what the hell is going on? Like, I've got such a problem with cancel culture. I'm sure most people do. I just cannot tolerate the concept of it. Because like we've talked about earlier, everyone's going to say something stupid. Everyone's going to, whether they're in the public eye or not, you're going to thoughtlessly say something because you didn't sleep enough the night before or because you didn't know enough about a subject, which is fine. We're not meant to know everything about every subject in the world. So we're going to make mistakes, then learn and probably not do it again or maybe, you know, approach things in a different way. But to sort of cancel someone out, and I'm sure... I've experienced it. I'm sure you have not to the point where like I don't I cease to exist and I'm not working anymore, but I've certainly had it and with friends. And it is deeply painful. And you know, what is that judgment about? It's like judgment has been inflated so hugely and it's always, you know, been around forever since man and woman were walking about working out who they should hang out with and what tribe they should be in. But it's just gone bananas. It, it really has. So bananas and it, you know Is that because, I don't know, I'm trying to work it out as I'm talking to you, but I guess a lot of people judge themselves so much that they're just projecting it onto other people. They're not forgiving themselves of their past, so therefore it's way easier to go, I blame you, you, you're way worse than I am. It's just that on a giant level, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of from two things. I think it's one that we're all getting our information from so many different sources now. So, for example, my dad probably is reading a newspaper uh, that I'm not reading and he's not looking at Twitter. And, you know, we're coming at things maybe from different angles. So when we have a conversation, it could get quite heated because it's like, well, I've got my information from this place and you've got yours from that place and we disagree and that's fine. But then also I think through the pandemic it got worse because we were also isolated and therefore we're all in our own heads more. I had a friend kind of get quite annoyed with me about something I didn't do, something I didn't say, 
But I was like, I didn't know you wanted me to say that until you just said that. Like, (laughs) are we all meant to be mind reading at this point? So I think that is kind of wild. And I also think cancel culture is like this umbrella term for so many things. Like Harvey Weinstein going to jail, cancelled. Great. He did something really bad and his career was cancelled. That isn't a new thing that that's been going on for a long time. Someone being held to account. But then we've got, you know, like a 15 year old on Twitter saying like a joke and then not being allowed to go to a college that they applied for. Is that really kind of do we want to cancel like a child before they can rectify? So I think it's really nuanced and really complicated. And obviously my book is not even that long. I'm talking about really massive themes in this book. But really, for me, I never really write books to be like, here's what I think about the world. And it's all so correct. It's not that at all. It's just like poking the fire a bit and being like, can we just talk about this stuff, please? And can we say things that we mean in a kind way um, and not be scared to say what we really think? I completely agree. Because also, say we go back to that 15 year old who didn't get to go to the college they wanted because they said a joke online. Say they'd said that joke in a group of friends 20 years ago. You know, a couple of people in the group might have thought, oh, I didn't really like the flavour of that joke or whatever. But then it's sort of forgotten. But because things are in black and white and we're seeing them and they have this sort of existence post the moment, that's the scary bit, you know, that these things sort of live on or they can spiral out of control, they can spread. It just feels scary. So, you know, even if I look at my own relationship with social media, I know that even though I'm older, obviously, than I was 10 years ago, I'm way more apprehensive about posting certain things today than I was 10 years ago because I think things are getting worse in terms of outside judgment and people making assumptions about you or making whole stories up about what your general opinion of the world is because you said one thing, which again is so unhelpful. I know you know, Russell Brand's done a really good job of talking about this in such detail about how you know you can have one opinion or say one thing and all of a sudden everyone says you're right or you're left or whatever and it's like wait we're allowed to have opinions within certain structures or not align to any of it and just have thoughts and feelings but I think it's it is scary because it is getting worse and I do sometimes worry I don't want to upset anyone I don't want to offend anyone but I take it to the nth degree where it's like actually wild that I sometimes worry What if I post a picture of myself and a comment saying that I'm feeling really good and happy and there are people out there that don't? But this is the nature of the world. There'll be days where I feel like shit and other people feel great. But we're we're sort of pointing the finger at everyone constantly. You can't do this because I don't feel like that or you haven't thought about my situation. It's impossible for us to have that grand scope of the whole world and every human on it. But we're being expected to. It's bananas. It it is bananas because... Really, if you wrote a tweet, it could be taken seven billion different ways, yeah. like however many people are in this world. It could be dissected in countless ways. And I think context is so important, like who you are in the context of what you're saying. We can't keep taking people out of context. It's just so damaging. And also the fact that, you know, we are growing all the time. I love this Adam Grant quote, which is like, if you don't look back at your past self and cringe, you haven't grown. <laughs> Like I oh, look, that gives me instant relief. <laughs> he says it's a great thing. I love looking back at my past work and cringing because I'm just so proud that I've moved on. And I really worry that we think that everyone is in this like permanent state of like being perfect. And I don't know, I'm hope I am optimistic though. I think we're in a really weird time and I think things are gonna change. Well, I think, you know, your books come at the perfect time because there are a lot of people questioning this stuff and questioning their own use of the internet or social media and wanting to do things differently. But you do feel an element of like you're swimming upstream because so much of it, which is determined, especially on social media, by algorithms, makes you feel like you're not part of the party or you're getting it a bit wrong. And that's the thing we need to like really dissect is, wait, these algorithms are just throwing stuff out that all of a sudden everyone's wearing beige. And if you're not wearing like a beige camisole and jogging bottoms, then you've sort of missed the trend boat or whatever. And I love the section in the book that you talk about really encouraging people to get weird, like to be their own weird, wonderful self. And 
I think, you know, I don't want to be patronising, say, especially for young people, because I think all ages deal with this and feel like they've got to fit in or follow what's going on. But this algorithm thing scares the shit out of me because it stops, it sort of stops us from going outside of the mainstream popular narrative of what's happening at, rather than going off and exploring wait a minute, does this feel right to me? Do I want to wear beige joggers? Probably not. I'm going to go over here and look at something else. That scares the shit out of me. So I think like the be weird thing is just massively important. Yes. And actually there's a bit in your book, a paragraph about finding your weird again. And I was yeah. like, yes, I love Best. that because it really is a death of creativity having to fit in and follow the algorithm. And what's scary is that it's so ingrained in us as social animals. Like, of course, we want to follow the herd. Of course, if everyone's posting this thing, we must post it. We, we don't even think half the time. And then months later, people are dissecting it, going, actually, we should, probably shouldn't have posted that. And that didn't help the cause. And I think um, in the book, I talk about Le Pause, which is like this French uh, author who talks about pausing um, I think it's to do with motherhood and, and parenting but how pausing can be a really good thing before you kind of make rash decisions with your newborn and things like that anyway completely not on that theme I've, che- I've kind of taken it and applied it to pausing on the internet and how before you make a decision or before you even retweet something before you just like dash something off just just pause just take a minute because half the time we're really in this fight or flight mode and people have really looked into that, that when we see something quite triggering, our brains don't know that it's digital. We, we think it's like something standing right in front of us. And I do it all the time now, like before replying to an email that's annoyed me or replying to like a weird comment that someone sent me or seeing everyone wearing the beige trousers. I'm just like, wait a minute, I'm going to check in with myself here. Mm, don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of stillness, isn't it, that gives you that clarity to then get to that gut instinct of well, what is right for me and I think we're all so scared of getting it wrong like not that there is such a thing but like getting life wrong and to quote another amazing person you quote Fleabag um, and oh, the yeah. moment in the series where which is just the most I need to rewatch all of Fleabag because it's just brought it brought me so much joy when she's in the confessional and she's sort of saying I just wish someone would tell me like what to wear and what to eat and who to date and I think so many of us feel like that because we're so bombarded with information And we don't want to get it wrong. We've got this huge fear of getting it wrong. And I don't know what that is. Is that because we're really scared of being disliked? Or are we just scared that it is simply we're getting it wrong and it's just that is the the base fear there? I think it's the fact that uncertainty is the most awkward uncomfortable emotion for a lot of us we we want to know what's going on like we love having a diary and like knowing what we're doing and we love planning and that's why the pandemic was so so hard for a lot of people especially like control freak people who you know love to know what exactly what they're doing on every single day and I know a lot of people like that luckily I'm not really like that I'm quite happy to sort of flow and and move around but I think it's the wanting certainty. So people who don't know very much on a topic, this has been scientifically proven, double down more in their thoughts and their opinions. So Twitter is a lot of people knowing for sure what they think about everything in the world. They know exactly when the pandemic might end. They know exactly, you know, the future of the vaccines. They know exactly, you know, it's OK to say we're not sure. We trust the experts. We trust scientists. We trust doctors, whatever it might be. But we're OK. It's, it's OK to say there's a tiny slither of we don't know. We don't, none of us know anything about anything, P.S. Like, no, I think yeah, that is like exactly. always the conclusion of that is we don't, know, we don't know what's out there. When we point to the sky, we have literally no clue. We don't know what happens when we die. Like we literally know fuck all. But I think we're quite scared to say that we're quite scared to admit oh I don't I don't really know or worse I don't really have an opinion on that like that seems to be the biggest crime not having an opinion because I sometimes feel like should I be making some sort of like commentary on a global situation or whatever's going on and a lot of time I think I don't know enough about this I don't know the minutiae of this situation or what's going on I don't feel worthy of making some sort of public statement and that's, again, where things get really gritty because there's also this this very, very new concept that if you don't say something, you don't care. And I've got a real bugbear with this as well. 
you know, what's to say that you're not privately squirrelling away doing something, even if it's just to help your elderly neighbour or you're really looking out for one of the mums on the school run who's having a tough time or whatever. Why is that less worthwhile than having to say something, probably without action, publicly? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I know I talk about this in the book because I think there is a disconnect there with what's easy. It's so easy to do some Instagram stories, yeah. to show that you care, tick, done, and then go and like nap for the rest yeah, of the exactly. day. That's not activism or <clears throat> being active in any way. And I think it's the performative nature of, of all this stuff. And I, and I love that we are starting to talk a bit more about that. Your offline activity is really important. What you do in your real life is important. Even the conversation about, about being an ally. Well, what are you doing around your dinner table? Because actually that's way more important than what you're posting on Twitter before you go to bed to random strangers. So I think it is bringing it back. And, you know, the internet is amazing and we can solve things. And we can, and like, you know, this is such a small example, but there was a sausage dog in my neighbourhood that got stolen recently. And through Instagram and social media, we got the dog back. Oh, and that is like wow. the smallest example. But I was like, well, without the internet, the dog would never have been found. And of course, there's countless examples of like campaigns that are working. But I really think we need to go back to basics. And someone actually called my book quite simple the other day. And I was like, is that is that a compliment or an insult? I'm not sure, but I actually am going to take it as a compliment because it is a simple book. I'm literally saying we're in a time where there are Twitter bots and apps telling us to drink water, to moisturise, to go to bed early, to breathe. This is basic stuff, yeah. but I think we need it right now. I think we we're do. all really confused. And I think we need to like see a small group of friends um, Go to, you know, go to bed early, drink more water and all that stuff, but but really just like be with ourselves a bit like more. Like we used to. Like we used to. Without being told. <laughs> we just used to do stuff. Yeah. Like I think about it all the time. Like even in my early 20s where social media was just starting, but it wasn't like you would go on it every day. You might just check in with Twitter here and there. But I lived down the road from where I am now. And I just used to get up if I wasn't filming because I'd do these intense blocks of filming for like months and then I might have a week doing nothing. I'd just get on my bike, no particular plan, cycle about, probably wouldn't even see anyone, but quite content doing that. Didn't really give much thought to, you know, any particular thing that I was up to. I was just having a day mooching about. And now there's this sort of lingering background guilt that we should be using our time really wisely, like all these awful catchphrases that we get hooked into, like living our best life and all this stuff. And it's like, well, sometimes... You do need to just retreat and be on your own or, you know, and you talk about this in the book, how certainly social media is an introvert's dream because you think you're socialising or you can trick yourself into thinking you've got this huge network of friends or you're interacting with other people without ever having to go anywhere. And again, the pandemic was a prime example of this. We were all desperately trying to connect with all these new things that were popping up, like house party, which scared the living <laughs> crap out of me. Because like, people kept popping up on my phone and I was like cooking. I'm like, how did you appear on my phone? Delete app. But, you know, it's... What we have to do, again, when we're connecting with ourselves is to know I want to go and socialise with people right now versus I need to retreat, I need to hibernate, I need to be on my own. I'm an introvert. I love, love talking to people. I love having deep conversations with people and learning. But I really need to pull back and retreat as well. And we almost feel a bit weird and bad about doing that. It's true. And Zoom fatigue was a huge thing during the pandemic oh. because it was really confusing for our brains because we were seeing someone who we love dearly, but we couldn't be with them. And we were almost being reminded by them being on a screen that the world had changed. So everything about that interaction was really off. And also you're looking at your face as well. And it's oh, all a bit, that bit of it. too much, too much. <clears throat> so I think you're right. It can be really great. Like I know a lot of people with like chronic fatigue or chronic illness or disability that for, for them thank god we finally opened this conversation about working yeah. from home and flexibility they've been doing it for years and feeling bad about it when actually they could absolutely do their work and be productive and d do their bit not having to leave the house so that's good in a way that we've now opened up that conversation but sometimes you're so right we, we fell into this kind of trap I think of thinking self-care was just shutting off the entire world and being by yourself and there's nothing wrong of course with some of those nights where you're just like oh everyone can go away but there were those memes I remember on Instagram with like the cat wearing the turban being like um my you know it went like my cat my, my friends cancelled yay or whatever <laughs> and it's like <laughs> that's fine I I also um am the cat in the turban yeah. like wanting everyone to go away 
But sometimes you need your friend to go, no, put the turban away. Yeah. You're, we're going to the pub. Yeah. You need to have a rant. You need a hug. You need a physical socialising. And I think that that's what it's all about, really, is um, getting to know ourselves more. Because, we, you know, our true nature in the world isn't to be sat in like a little cubicle at work. It's not to be have strip lighting in an office. It's not to be at home the whole time by yourself. We're social animals. We need to be out and about. And um, there's so many things that the world kind of wants us to to wants to trap us with. And that we're like on this treadmill of like success. And we get to the end and we're like, what was that all about? Yeah. What was that all about? And why is no one saying, well done you for not making any mistake? Like it's just an empty sort of promise. for not doing anything you wanted to do. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And you were just so brilliant at like keeping everything on time and ticking all the boxes or whatever. It's so bizarre. And also because of all the constant messaging that we're getting, one of the main dead ends that I think all of us, if we're really honest, arrive at is feeling like we're not enough. We don't even know why. We're literally like, I don't know what exactly is sort of lacking within me, but I don't feel enough. I feel like it all the time. And I know about this stuff like many people do. I research a lot of it. I write about it. Still fall into the trap of, oh, my God, I'm not out doing this. Or, oh, my God, I'm not doing as brilliantly in this lane as that person or whatever. Whereas before, I really didn't think like that. I was just like you know, what would make me feel good in this moment? Or if I work harder, could I do this? And I was just working to my own accord. Now there's this huge feeling of lacking. And we know that there's a mirage. We know that what we're seeing isn't necessarily real, that people might be at a party having a shit time, but it looks like an absolute raucous, wild situation. But we're still, we're still like trapped in the myth. We can't see the wood for the trees. It's bizarre. I know. We tell ourselves so many stories. It's so weird, isn't yeah. it? It's happened to me so many times where I'd be like, oh, your holiday looked lovely. And they'd be like, oh, we had a fight on the plane. <laughs> Our luggage got yeah. stolen. We food nearly didn't shit. get there. Like, yeah. yeah, I got ill, had food poisoning. Mm-hmm. But, you know, of course we don't We don't share some of that. Mm. Um, but, yeah, you're right. It, it is. We, we kind of make it all up. But I think it's sort of up to us to know what mood we're in as well before we go on the internet. But one thing I have realised and I think is really important to say is when you realise that FOMO, the, co- the concept of literally fear of missing out is, mar- is marketing. <laughs> it's, it's brands wanting you to be like, oh, look at you missing out. Come and book this thing. Come and go to this party. Come and buy this thing that you don't need. FOMO is literally just advertising. And so when you really realise that, I think you kind of free yourself up. And on the flip side, of course, we're missing out. We're missing out all the time. The fact that we're in this room together, which I'm very happy to be doing. Me too. I'm, I'm, I've made, we've all made a decision to miss out on something when we say yes to something. And I think it's really important to, to know that because burnout can happen, I think, when you are so scared of missing out that you're doing, trying to cram too much in. And actually, you need to make a few decisions every day and stick to them. And then you're not kind of splitting your mind into like 10 different things and thinking you can be in 10 different places we can't and that goes back to us working with our intuition like do I really want to be doing all that stuff probably the answer is probably not otherwise you would have pushed yourself to do it Mm -hmm. if you're not at that party or not whatever doing whatever it is it just goes back to what do I really like rather than how everyone else seems so happy why am I not doing what they're doing it is you know goes back to that marketing trick you're talking about it's yeah there's something about I think JOMO is like the joy of missing out, which is is when you're on the sofa going, I I don't want to be anywhere else. Yeah. But I also think that envy and jealousy is a really good, healthy and useful emotion. Because when I'm scrolling through Instagram and I'm jealous of something, that's literally information Mm -hmm. of like, oh, I'd quite like to see that. Oh, I'd quite like to write a play. I'm a little bit jealous that you've done that or whatever the example is. And when you're not jealous... That's also information because you're like, nah, don't, that doesn't bother me. And so I think we can reframe that emotion because it's such a, we, we think it's such an ugly emotion, but it's actually, it's okay. You're so right. We always apply shame when it comes to jealousy or envy. Like, God, that's so embarrassing that I'm, you never admit that freely, usually. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm exactly the same as you. I will have all the feelings of that ugliness of, oh my God, I feel so jealous. I might even be like, have some sort of, horrible acerbic sort of slur going on in my head when I'm thinking about that person and then I go wait a minute you want to do that you want to do that or maybe you don't want to do that but it looks really shiny and it makes you feel lesser than so let's dig into that and look at why there's always 
something that can help us unpick all of that mess. So it is, it's a super healthy emotion to be jealous or envious or whatever it is. Um, a really lovely, simple way for us to get back to basics, which I know you're a huge fan of and you write about in the book, and I'm obviously a fan of because I have this pad here, is writing with an actual pen. Yeah. And I love finding a really good biro that is really soft when it touches the page. <laughs> like There's nothing quite I like that, that feeling of, oh my God, it's just like... Oh, dreamy, the whole thing. Um, and I always, you know, I've been on countless podcasts where the host has their questions on an iPad, which is amazing. But I just couldn't, I couldn't, I like writing and having it in a book. And one day I'll hopefully look at these. I always treat myself to a really nice book. And then one day I'll, when I'm old and I can be going to my kids, I interviewed Emma Gannon and Jamie Oliver and Tuppence Middleton and all these people. I can sort of boast about it because I'll have it all written down. And I think... You know, what I know that you love doing Julia Cameron's morning pages, but I think if you can find something where you're handwriting, it's quite amazing, it's quite beautiful. What has it, what's it brought you? It is amazing. And Julia Cameron, who is the patron saint mm-hmm. of, of all creativity, an amazing woman, she is a real fan of writing by hand. And, and I, th- I think I read somewhere that when you're holding a pen, there's something about your hand being co- obviously being connected to the rest of your body and your brain. You're flowing through your body Ooh. rather than when you're on a computer, it, it's not as flowy. It, it's just not the same. The things that come out by hand when you write, you'll be amazed the truth that comes out rather than if you're typing. When you're typing, you're filtering. Yeah. You're, you're, there's, there's something there. There's like a barrier there. When you're writing by hand, it's completely different. And she, yeah, she encourages you to kind of get up in the morning and write freehand and, and not look at it again and for it to be messy and all over the margins. And basically kind of what we're saying, like being imperfect, Don't you don't have to spell things properly. You, you know, you can be a complete mess on that page, but that's who you are and what you're thinking that day. And there's just like a truthfulness in it. But during the pandemic, I had massive writer's block, creative block, couldn't write anything. I was just feeling really sad. The world, I was like a sponge to the world. You know, we all were. I'd go for a walk around the park. Everyone was sad in the park. The dogs were even like really sad. I was like, this is (laughs) awful. How am I going to go home and write like a funny novel? This is not going to happen. So I didn't write anything for a few years. But what I did do is journal and write by hand and take myself to cafes when we could. Um... But just sit and write. And actually, it was really nice to take myself out of like author publishing mode of like my books are a thing to be sold. Just write for fun. And I found out a lot about myself, actually. It's weird, the truth that comes out of a pen. It's actually... We had Gabby Bernstein on and she very specifically does rage on the page. So like lets out, you know, hell and fury. And I did it recently out of necessity. And I was like bloody hell that was some evil stuff that came out of me and not to feel then guilty like I'm a terrible person but that needed to come out it needed to come out I couldn't have typed that I probably wouldn't have said that to anybody else because I would have felt mortified that these words were coming out of me but now it's separate to, it's out of me it's gone and it's a good way of just sort of processing and even if like you burn it at the end of the day mm-hmm. and have a sort of ceremony around that physical thing dissipating It is powerful shit. It's so powerful. And one thing that happened to me, which I found really interesting, is the more I was writing and journaling and doing, you know, yeah, getting angry on the page, I started not to drink any wine anymore. Like, I was obviously... And there's nothing wrong with the odd glass of wine. There's nothing wrong with drinking to anyone listening. But... I was obviously doing that for numbing myself a little bit or there was something that was coming out and I couldn't express it. And it was literally the exact time I started unleashing my true feelings onto the page was the time I just didn't need to drink anymore. That is wild. So it's all connected, isn't it? Of course it is. But we, I think... I guess when you're writing with a pen, you then have ultimate awareness because it's there. There's something has transpired, like the emotions are now on a bit of paper. Whereas before we're going, no, no, don't think of that, la, 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 or whatever it is. So if you have that awareness, you can can choose to make a change or like you've just said, it just sort of happens. It's quite effortless in a sense because the awareness is there and it's quite obvious what you need to do or don't need to do. It's Well, you're kind of, and and the, the thing that I really love now and what I really stick to is, I I don't want to abandon myself anymore. So this is the whole thing of like, we abandon who we really are when we try and fit in, when we wear the beige trousers, (laughs) like whatever we're doing that's like just following the crowd. 
we're abandoning like who we are and I think it sounds cheesy but it's like we've got this like inner child person that's going hey you're ignoring me can you like give me some attention and actually like listen to yourself and so I think by journaling that makes that inner thing quite happy because it's like oh thanks you're like sitting with me and listening to me instead of going to the party and like numbing it all out yeah you're so right it's so it's so wonderful and let's talk a bit about uh, creativity you just mentioned the wonderful Julia who we both absolutely adore and um Around the time that Julia came on Happy Place, I watched this outrageously amazing archive clip of David Bowie, and you, I'm oh, sure you yes. will have seen it. And he talks, this is probably around the year you were born, and the internet was just sort of stirring. And he's, who's he talking to? Jeremy Paxman or someone like that. And he has sort of instant concern and sort of trepidation stepping towards it. Whereas the person interviewing him is like, what are you talking about? Surely this is just another way for us to communicate and gather information. And he's like, he's foreseeing this years and years in advance of when this started to really happen. But he very specifically pinpointed the sort of interim between somebody creating something and someone having commentary on it. And fearing that we would only believe something was art once it had been commented on. Whereas, and, and we're, that's so normalised now. You'd be like, what? Well, of course, you have to see a painting. It's like, well, no, the person that's made it can still profess this is art. I have created it. But we're so wedded to the fact now that unless someone's gone, your book was amazing. Here's a review. Or that piece of art you've done is sensational. This is my, you know, critique of it. Or whatever the creation is that until it's had commentary it ceases to exist and the internet has has basically created that that blew my mind because I wasn't even aware that that was the sort of state of affairs until I heard him say it it's amazing how forward thinking he was it was actually sort of mysteriously like magical and kind of witchy yeah. watching yeah. him I say know. that from the past <laughs> like he's some you know a prophet of like telling us the future it was it's amazing everyone should go and listen to that but he's right I think we have forgotten what art is and we've forgotten that we exist even if no one sees it we you know it's like the whole does it exist if you didn't take a photo of it I think it's okay for things to just live in our heads and be memories and I mean it's a whole thing it, it's it ties in with the algorithm like it's okay to make something and if it's not validated by everyone it still matters and you still matter and that's why I think, you know, I can't remember what year it was when like the selfie was a thing and it was like the rise of the selfie and everyone was taking selfies. And like really behind that, all we're saying is people just want to be seen and heard yes. and people just want to be like, look, I'm alive and I'm here. Do you like me? And actually, when you strip it all back, it's kind of sweet the way that we use the Internet. We're all just like waving, being like, you're so we're right. all over here. <laughs> <laughs> it is really adorable. And, and I guess the problem being that, you know, on mass, people don't feel heard and they don't feel seen or understood, really. And it's our opportunity to sort of say, here I am. This is what I'm about. This is, you know, and I think we all do have a bit of a fear that what is my existence? You know, like what what is it for? What's it about? What is the purpose of me? What is the what impact am I going to have? And we're trying to use these digital tools to kind of explore that and give it a go. And I guess, you know, one of the lovely things about especially social media, and we've touched on this briefly, is the sort of sense of community that you can have. I think there's still a lot of confusion about, you know, what is a community or what is just actually an exclusive group of people that don't let others in. What do you think makes a healthy community online? Well, in the book, I write about the difference between tribe and community. And tribe is actually more like when you find your tribe, it's, it is said as a positive but sometimes that can be like only like-minded people and only these people and it can be quite cliquey community is like all different ages all different backgrounds all different opinions but you are a community who look out for each other and and I think what's really great about this time we're in and we're seeing it like we are going through the biggest change when it comes to like the media and entertainment that we've ever seen. I mean, magazines were on their last legs. I know. Um, look, at, you know, with the BBC at the moment and terrestrial TV channels and the rise of Netflix and the fact that YouTubers are being commissioned in different ways. Like, it's all changing. And that's great, I think, for the fact that there are no gatekeepers. Well, there are little gatekeepers anymore, thank God. But that also comes with its challenges as well. 
But what's really exciting is that anyone can start a podcast, anyone can start a blog. And I've always thought this and seen this. Like I didn't come from a traditional background. I didn't work like in a studio and I, I didn't make the tea and work my way up. I just I just had a website and now I'm doing all these incredible things. And I do find that amazing. And I do want to go and tell young people, you have a voice, you can do whatever you want to do. Like the internet is a tool to use in a positive way. But, we're, you know, people are still scared of that. But I, I think it's incredible. Oh, I do. I think it's really incredible because going back to that notion of us not really knowing anything, if we can sort of sit there impartially listening not to everyone and everything it's impossible but if we're open-minded enough to explore different avenues of thought different backgrounds that have informed people's life choices and where they're at today that I think can be a super beautiful thing to do in the fact that it's always humbling because you always go oh I hadn't really thought of that perspective before or that point of view and if we're only watching things that are mainstream that are very much filtered from a certain boss who's been chosen for that certain job, because it always comes down to an individual at the end of the day. If there is this free forum where we get to hear storytelling, which is so important from all different walks of life, all different mindsets, different experts out there, whoever it is, then we can sort of sit there, go back to our intuition and work out what does resonate and what does feel right without it being this is my opinion and it has to be right because I watched it on the news or whatever. It's like, well, we've got all these other places now to explore. YouTube, Instagram, inst there's some amazing Instagram lives that are happening with brilliant information. Like, you know, like you're saying, it, it's a really exciting time. Really exciting. And it's really exciting for two-way dialogue because... I wrote this book and at the end of the book I say like come and come and say hello what do you think this isn't about me as an author having a voice it's like no you also have a voice we all do and therefore I'm a really big fan of constructive criticism and commentary and comments on my work I love people who write to me and say oh I like this bit and this bit made me think and oh, I wasn't sure about this bit I have a voice and someone else has a voice this isn't you know some people are like well this is my thing and you can't have any comment on it. I mean, if you're going to be in this job, I don't think that works anymore. I don't think you can say, well, I have my say and you don't. No. It's like it has to go both ways. And I've started this new newsletter at the moment, which has a comment section. And that's the joy for me, the comment section, which I never thought I'd say as a past <laughs> journalist. But the point is that the people people want to be there. These are people who I have so much in common with and you know who challenge me and, and, and help me grow. And um, actually, there's an example in the book where I got into a bit of a like Twitter spat with someone. And um, we were, you know, you can't, you cannot get your point across on Twitter. And we, we were both getting really frustrated. And um, she came into my DMs and she was like, do you want to have, do you want to like have a phone call? And so we, Scary. I know, and we went on, we actually had a Google Hangout and we were on it there for an hour. And by the end, we were like, oh my God, we like, this was so much fun. We didn't, we still didn't agree. Fine. But we understood each other. But and that's I the have whole point, so isn't it? much respect for yes. her and she had respect for me. And we were like, have a lovely day. And I learned a lot. But yeah, didn't agree by the it end. It doesn't have to be a winner. It's like you can walk away, like you just said, going, yeah, we just think differently and that's fine. And that's again what I don't feel like there's enough space for that we can just all have our own opinions and, and disagree with each other. And it's absolutely fine. I think you're so right. And it's also about how we take on that commentary. We can take things really personally and go, oh, I'm wounded by these thoughts and feelings. Or we can get curious about it. And as painful as it can sometimes be, I always try to approach critique in that way and go, well, I wonder why that person has formed that idea about me or about what I've said. Why, why have I written down the thoughts that I've got and how have I been informed and influenced over my life and I think if you get curious about it then all of those sorts of spats that we've all gotten into just dilute a little bit because we go this is quite interesting if I just get a bit curious about it like the other day someone had said about bigger than us I'd seen on social media um oh I'm sort of sort of thinking about buying this book but I'm concerned that she's just sort of jumping on the celebrity bandwagon and writing about healing. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting comment because I'm always trying to sort of work with subject matters that I am passionate about. That's all I can do because otherwise I wouldn't be able to write it. And then it kind of took me off on this really interesting train of thought. And I thought, actually, that isn't even criticism. I 
if, you know, this is a subject I love. I'm not an expert. Everyone knows that. Otherwise, I'd be in a different job. But I am jumping on a bandwagon. Everyone needs to jump on a bandwagon of writing positive literature because there's so much darkness in the world. Write more positive books. Make more positive YouTube shows. Make more positive Netflix shows. We need more positive everything. I am fully on that bandwagon and like running with it. And I say to everybody else, jump on with us because we need more. So I think if you get curious, you can actually see so many different perspectives. And and it just it becomes an interesting exercise rather than it being like, oh, God, I feel so hurt by that. Completely. And it's amazing to have that distance, isn't it? Mm. Like you can read something and you're not immediately taking it really personally. You're just kind of like, okay, let me like unpick this. But I, I find it fascinating. And I, and I also think that at the moment, there's so many hotly debated topics. Like th- this idea of what's a debate and what's not a debate is really, really interesting. And I am aware that maybe I move through the world in a really curious, open way because I don't have a lot of struggles I don't have people telling me no all the time I I'm a white woman with quite a privileged life so I don't feel like I'm necessarily butting up against a lot of barriers and I think maybe I would be a different person if I had those that background where I was sort of like pushing up against things so I'm really aware of that that I there, there there's like an ease to like the way I see the world sometimes but I also think that there's no point saying This isn't a debate when, you know, when someone says, like, I think that women are not equal to men, I would be like, well, that's not up for debate because, of course, women are equal to men. But the point is that someone just said that, so they don't think it. Mm. So I want to lean into that and be like, why do you think that? Do you know what I mean? Instead of being, like, cancelled. Yeah. I just, I want to lean in and go, that's so interesting that you don't think women are equal to men. Yeah. No, I I completely agree. I think humans are endlessly fascinating because we're all different and we all have different ideas and opinions. And, you know, it's not about winning and constantly being like, I'm right, done, lovely jubbly. <laughs> it's, you know, life doesn't work like that. We've got to keep curious. Curiosity exactly. is the key. Well, look, this has been deeply fascinating and I've wanted to do this chat for so long. I could talk about this subject matter with you for years because there are so many little individual avenues we could walk down and go okay what's the joy of this bit but what's the problem here but I think go get Emma's book because it's amazing and it does you know and like you were saying earlier it does simplify a lot of stuff and we need that I don't want to read a book that over complicates something that already feels massively complicated you're just distilling it down to this is the bit that we need to talk about let's get stuck into it Um, so thank you for writing this beautiful book and thank you for being on Happy Place today Thank you so much for having me. Likewise, I think we should carry it on in a pub somewhere soon. Thank you so much. I'm well up for that. (laughs) 